Hey booktube, how's it going? <clears throat> this is going to be kind of all over the place. Um, but I think it all like kind of funnels in to one big question. <sighs> um, now, <clears throat> the Preptober disaster that is in the title is, and this might just be me thinking too much about it, but um, the story I'm writing for Nano is a sword and sorcery tale. At least that's what I wanted it to be originally. <clears throat> and then going through the plotting structure that I picked, which is the 27 chapter structure, um, I find that parts in that structure contradict what sword and sorcery is, at least to me, I guess. So it makes me have a hard time knowing where to go, what to do. Because, like, I plotted out my story, and I had to add um, a bunch of stuff that I didn't think about adding when I was first thinking about the story. Um, and then when I was going over, like, the beats and stuff, I was like, this doesn't feel sword and sorcery. This feels... Um, hero's journey kind of stuff. And, I'll, and like, I'm sure there's going to be people who argue with me on this. And that's fine. In fact, that is, um, like, I'm wanting that. Because I'm trying to figure out if I'm just being too hypercritical because I've been waiting so much for... Um, I've been waiting so long to start the story. Um, but to give you a little bit of background on sword and sorcery, so you can kind of understand what my point of this is, is that this year actually is the 90th anniversary of sword and sorcery that I'll say published sword and sorcery. Now there have been stories years and years before that I don't look at as sword and sorcery, but I look at as probably the inspiration for what became sword and sorcery. And even the story that I'm about to tell you about, um, to me, it's kind of sword and sorcery and spirit only. And that is because the, the first story is the Shadow Kingdom, which is a Cole of Atlantis story by Robert E. Howard. It was published in Weird Tales in August 1929. Now, in the Shadow Kingdom, Cole is the newly crowned King of Volusia. He um, was a barbarian from Atlantis, um, conquered the town and is now king. The town, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then these people want to get together with them and kind of like, you know, not bury the hatchet, but like, yay, you're king now. Let's all get together and do fun stuff. And then this dude shows up and he's like, hey, guess what? These guys um, are going to try to kill you. And he's like, huh? And so he goes out and Long story short, um, there are these serpent people who used to run Volusia. And they have been running Volusia in secret because they can take the form of humans. So it's very much like V or um, the reptilian conspiracy theories. Um, I don't know if this is where that started, but... Um, this is probably a good starting point. Um, and so 
long story short, short, um, Cole ends up, like, busting in after a failed attempt on his life and killing a duplicate of him, which ends up being a serpent man, and, um, everything's fine. Now, generally speaking, I'm like, okay, I don't know if this is sword and sorcery, because, like, you know, he's a king, um, things are kind of okay for him now, for the most part, but then I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, this is a individual struggle, like, it's very personal, they're coming after him specifically to take over and rule the kingdom, and I don't think Cole's going, I can't let this happen because I can't let these people rule the kingdom, I think he's saying, like, this can't happen because I don't want to die, and th we'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then the other half of Sword and Sorcery is the fact that the sorcerers are almost always... I'm trying to think of any um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, in, not inconsistent. Anyway, so I always think that in Sword and Sorcery, the hero has the sword, and the sorcerer is the evil one. The one who's fucking with nature. The one who's um, playing with things that they shouldn't play with. Um, that are dabbling in things unknown. Um, those are always the bad folks. And our typical barbaric heroes um, usually stop that evil, not because they want to make the world a better place, not because they want to, um, like, save a town. They usually do it because they don't want to be killed, and something's after them. And if you look at a lot of Conan stories, um, a lot of Conan stories, and I think even when El Sprague de Camp um, kind of takes over with those later... Um, Lancer and Ace books, he's even like, yeah, like, don't know about gods and religion, not that interested, not that interested in magic, magic people are weird, um, not really all that into it. So, like, even Elsprig de Camp as um, evil of a person as a lot of Robert E. Howard fans think he is, um, he even kept that going. As far as I can remember, I'm trying to place anything that would make that not true. But um, if leave it down below if I am misspeaking. So anyway, so when I look back at the Shadow Kingdom, even though I was feeling like, you know, this probably isn't a true sword and sorcery tale the way I see it, because of Cole's status, but Cole's status really isn't the point of the story. Cole doesn't want to die. <laughs> that's the point of the story, and that's what happens, and he's like, guess what? Like, I'm gonna do what I can do, and if you're one of those people who are like, yeah, but by the sax I rule was before um, Shadow Kingdom in terms of writing, um, even though it wasn't accepted. Um, and in that one, he tries to get much more political and tries to do s help out that couple and all this other stuff. Um, what I'll say about that is, is that A, it wasn't published, um, at least in his lifetime. And then it was reworked to be Phoenix on the Sword, which was the first published Conan story. And that whole um, subplot with the marriage and the different classes of slaves and non-slaves, that's not even in the Conan story that comes out of it. Um, and then if we look at that story, it's almost the exact same 
plot as the Shadow Kingdom in the sense that Conan is now this king. And the thing that I like about Conan being king, because typically I don't like those stories. I like Conan, like, wandering and getting into adventures and then wandering some more. Um, but the thing that's neat about Conan when Conan's king it's like the grass is always greener on the other side kind of theory. Like, the first stories of Conan we got, he was king. And um, it was later in his life. And so everything else we get is like all the fun stuff that led up to that. But as Conan's king, he's like... I really miss just, like, wandering around in the woods and sleeping under the stars and, like, sleeping in these chambers with all these people around me. Like, this isn't what I want. And the fact that he knows that at that point and then all the rest of the Conan stories we get are... Him as he's aging, getting up to the point where he's going to be king, even though we know deep down he really doesn't want it. But he was doing it because he could. And now that he had it, it, it doesn't taste that nice, if, that, if you know what I'm saying. So anyway, so the whole sword and sorcery thing to me your hero in a sword and sorcery tale is not a hero he is someone who just doesn't want to die he wants to be the last one standing with his sword or club or axe or whatever and the only reason why he even took it out in the first place was so he wouldn't be dead so I think like the first point in a sword and sorcery story is that your hero doesn't want to die. He's not duty bound. He's not, um, or she, you know, I'm not trying to like gender this, but, um, they're not bound by anything. They're not bound by, which is why I don't really look at Solomon Cain as a sword and sorcery, um, hero. Although a lot of people will say Solomon Cain is, I don't really look at it like that because I feel like he's duty bound to his God. And, um, I think that like kind of pollutes the water a bit. Now, another thing about sword and sorcery, this is 1929. Okay. Um, Things are not going great financially um, in America, and it's just going to get worse over the next couple years. Um, especially um, when the Great Depression hits, the Conan stories are really going to take off. And in Depression-era America, I really think that Robert E. Howard and probably his contemporaries of the day who might have been doing like weird fantasy stuff at the time. I really have to study the lesser known writers of like weird tales in the thirties. It's on my list, but I feel like with the depression, the biggest feeling that would probably come out of that as survival. Like, so when I look at a sword and sorcery hero, I look at them as a survivalist. Like, kind of in the same ways as you would have um, in your post-apocalyptic tales now. You know, just this whole, um, like, no matter what, you got to get through the next few pages of this chapter just so you're not dead and I know that's like well duh, that's like every story like who wants to read a story where the main character dies in the first three pages what's the rest of the book about but that to me is like 
the motivating factor. And now Conan is always going to be like the go-to, especially when I'm talking about the 30s. So I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, okay, were there times when Conan did things out of duty rather than um, survival? And, like, there's a bunch of stuff I could think about. Because, like, there's always, like, him wanting to save the girl. Especially in the middle period Conan stuff. And, yeah, he wants to save the girl. But I don't know what his motivations are for that. Is he wanting to save the girl because he feels like he's, like a steward of the females who are weaker than him or something and he has to protect them? Or is it that, like, in a couple hours after this whole thing's done, if he doesn't have a chick there to bandage his wounds or take care of him that way or take care of him that other way, he might be really bummed out. Um... So there's all that, and then there's, like, um, Tower of the Elephant is another example. Like, he goes to steal this stuff just so he could say he did it. Because no one else could get into this tower. And this creature from another world asks him to do this extremely dangerous favor, um... And he's like, all right. Now, how Conan handles this oath in Tower of the Elephant, like where he basically, if you don't know the story, I'm ruining it, but there's this alien being that is being kept in this tower that basically fuels this evil sorcerer's magic. So this creature asks Conan to kill him and then um, bring out its heart into this stone and then take the stone into the sorcerer and put it on the table and say these magic words and then um, the whole tower will come crashing down. And it's like Conan could have just stolen all the jewels if that's what he wanted to do. But at the time, he's like, yeah, this seems like an okay thing to do. Whereas in, like, The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, there's that, and even Star Wars, if we're going, like, full-on hero's journey here, there's the, I don't know if I want to do this, I don't think, I can't do it, but I'm being forced to do it, I'm being bound to do it by duty, I have to do this thing, um, after I didn't want to do it. And in Conan, it's just like, mm. So, the whole... I don't know, the whole world of what sword and sorcery is, to me, compared to high fantasy and um, just the Tolkien-esque world of everything that happened after that, um, is weird. Like, I don't want to do that kind of story. There's been numerous stories. And uh, yeah, there's been numerous sword and sorcery things too. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> I've heard it. Um, but like, like another big, like high fantasy to sword and sorcery differences in, um, sword and sorcery, you have your evil sorcerers in high fantasy. You have evil sorcerers, but then you also have like Gandalf, you know, who is not an evil sorcerer. Um, and I don't know how I feel about that. And, like, with Fawford and Grey Mauser, the Fritz Leiber series, the Grey Mauser really is, like, riding on the freaking blade of a sword for me, dude. Like, um, or he's on the knife's edge, we'll say. Because he's the Grey Mauser because he was doing stuff he probably shouldn't do with the magic that he was learning. 
So he's not necessarily an evil sorcerer, but he's not really a sorcerer sorcerer. But then, as the books go, he pulls out some pretty crazy crap. So, what the heck? And, like, what kind of guy is he? Because for the most part, the Grey Mauser is very much in tune with what I feel like a sword and sorcery character should be. It's just that damn magic. Okay, so anyway, so bringing this back to what my problem is, is that when we look at a lot of the plot points that you would have in the hero's journey or um, in the 27 um, chapter plot outline that I'm using right now um, for my um, Preptober stuff instead of using what I normally would use. And like, don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed looking at these other bits of things that I would never do. Like for instance, I'm going to, you guys can't see this, but I can see it. So let me look at this real quick. Fred, mm, where is it? Nope. 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 Okay, here we go. So, typically, in the stuff I write, I really like there to be something big happening right away. Um, in Black Star Canyon, or Black Star Murder, um, like, the mayor finds a body um, on his property. That is basically the inciting incident, um, and everything goes from there. But in most books, it got really windy all of a sudden, so my computer's like shaking, my beard's blowing, the whole deal. Um, but in like most of these um, plot structure things, they want you to like have at least a chapter of where you're just introducing people to the characters and to the world and. Um, just like setting everything up, you know? Um, and then after that, the next chapter or a couple chapters after you've done this is when the inciting incident happens. And I don't understand why you, I mean, you can do this. There are no rules, but like, I don't understand why the inciting incident can't happen as we are being introduced to everything. Um, I think it's more of a thing where you see the idyllic world that they want to have, and then you have this thing that kind of muckies up their world. I think the problem for me is that the characters I write typically aren't that idyllic, and they don't have an idyllic world. Um, things are... They're not anti-heroes by any means, but things are usually not, like, flowers and cherries. What am I talking about? So then you have, like, the fallout, the action, the consequence, rebellion, blah, 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 pressure, plot, twist, push, conflict. Okay, now when we get to Act 2, this is another thing that I've never done. Um, in... Block four, you have the new world and how your character is going to relate to that new world. And then you have the fun and games time where they're like, Ooh, this new world is exciting now. Oh, yeah, all right. And then you have the old contrast of like the um, new world compared to the world they came from. And for me, at this point in my story, my hero is in a slave train dragging a sled of corpses being and he's being like whipped by dudes on giant rats so it's like um did I put this in too early did I put it in too late um this this new world isn't exciting it's it's not fun um and yeah the the old to new contrast is um, I'm a slave right now, and before I wasn't a slave. Or then I could go, or maybe I was. Maybe I was a slave to society, man. And see, that's another thing, because how this story opens up, 
is I have my hero and his wife and his um, son who is becoming a man. But they're basically on the run for something that, that my character did before the story starts. So they've left their village. They are just like in the woods living off the land. And the son doesn't really know why they left in the first place. Um, and he's pissed off because he just wants to go back home and hang out with his friends and all this other stuff. So, like, maybe I am having all of these things in the right places, but they feel wrong. Um, and, like, I guess as far as, like, my story goes compared to what I hoped my story would be compared to what this plot outline is wanting me to do, I feel like, um, my hero having a family is kind of muddying up the works. But kind of not, because it's still survival. He's still trying to do anything he can do to live. But he does want to keep his family safe, too, so he is duty-bound to that. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Um... That duty gets taken away from him pretty quick. Um, let me see. So we have build up midpoint reversal. <sighs> I don't know. Like, I just feel like a lot of these. I think I talked about this yesterday. It's like <sighs> a lot of plot outlines wants you to be very introspective with your characters. But I feel like, at least this genre that I'm writing, but I feel like I would feel this way too, even if it was like a hard-boiled detective story. Um, you almost don't want to have them look inwardly a lot, because um, I think what people want to see and what that character would really be are not similar. But if it was like a first person story, I could see all of these things working out a little bit better. Like if it was like your typical thirties through the fifties, hard boiled detective who, um, the story's in first person and, blah 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 that that would almost make a little bit of sense but um yeah I just maybe I just don't write likable characters maybe that's what the problem is what do you think Fred anyway so I just I just don't know if this is what this should be because I feel like in putting all these things in here that this plot outline is asking me to do, I've kind of turned this into more of a Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones world, whereas before when I was thinking, and maybe that's the difference between um, sword and sorcery and high fantasy, that when you have sword and sorcery, there's not enough... Um, there's not enough stuff there to write a novel of it. Um, maybe I'll read Hour, in the Dra Hour of the Dragon again. Um, I started reading it again a little while ago and then stopped. So, um, I don't know. So let me know what you think down below. Am I full of shit? Like, does any of this make sense? Um, or should I just quit fucking thinking about it and just start writing even though we're still like, what, 10 days away from November? Um, actually, no, not that. Um, but yeah, like, is that something I should do? Let me know down below. Thank you guys so much. And I hope your Preptober is going swimmingly.